There we go. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, we are recording. Thank you. We have a, a few more people as well. Um, before I introduce our speakers for today, I'm very excited to hear from, I just want to mention a few other things that I stuck up on the agenda, and I'll put the agenda in the chat for anyone interested. Um, in two weeks, our next SIG meeting is we're going to have Harris Kamal, the Chief Revenue on Officer of Chronicled, the creators of Metalledger come on, talking about financial transaction and life sciences and how they're using blockchain to revolutionize charge chargebacks and claims in the healthcare system. So that's something that I think is going to have implications certainly for people across the healthcare industry, but also for other industries where chargebacks and claims are an issue. And then on October 26th, GBBC is going to have an event that I just learned about this morning, Real World Use Cases Transforming Supply Chains. And that will feature Sandra Rowe, the founder and CEO, Paul Rapino and Dale Christie, Paul and Dale are our guest speakers today, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned their event coming up. And a quick announcement for the SIG. Many of you have been following the ebook that we've been working on for months now. We are on target to publish this next month, so at the next meeting in two weeks, we'll give you a little bit more information on that. But we're really excited with the, we're really excited about the way it's shaping up. We're gonna have some very interesting use cases featured, including including uh, Metal Edge, our, our speaker for in two weeks. So that said, that out of the way, again, I want to welcome today Paul Rapino and Dale Christie. Paul is the Chief Growth Officer of the Global Blockchain Business Council. And Dale Christie is FedEx Business Fellow, Blockchain Strategist, and Chairman of the Beta Standards Council. A few months ago, we learned how the uh, Beta Standards Council merged with GBBC. So I know we're all interested in learning more about that. The, the title of their presentation today is How Emerging Technology is Transforming Global Supply Chains. Paul, would you like to take it from here? I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have um, a smaller group, so it'd be great to understand, Alicia, if you can give us a little background on what you guys are working on and kind of where you're going, and then we can direct the, the uh, presentation accordingly, and um, I can give more background on, on what we're doing, but it'd be great to get a little background on the group. Okay, so... The, the group varies from week to week. I'm just quickly taking, uh, like assessing um, who is on the call, some new people, some people I've seen before. The supply chain and trade finance SIG is a product of the merger last year of the separate supply chain SIG and the trade finance SIG. A year and a half ago, we decided to, um, to merge so that we could um, focus on the many ways that supply chain and trade finance are intersect. Some people here are on the more technical side. Some people are not. Some people have um, years of experience in supply chain management and or trade finance. Um, we are recently starting to see more people with the technical skills, with the developer develop, development skills. Um, but right now that's not what we're focused on. So. What we generally have been spending a lot of our time on is having a better understanding of who is doing what in this space using blockchain, especially using Hyperledger blockchain to have a real impact, not just oh, the potential use cases, but what are the real use cases? Who has this in production? What are their returns on investment of actually using this? And one thing we've certainly seen is in a number of cases in some companies and some governments, they might be using a blockchain backend, but they're not talking about it mm -hmm. because the the word blockchain itself has become something of a catalyst for disagreement, for people to become highly suspicious. But it is mm -hmm. such a powerful technology yeah. that um, in order to be really effective, it, it's becoming more and more widespread. 
And so we want people to understand what these use cases are and what the actual returns on investment are, why they're so powerful, how they're so powerful, and why companies think it's important to use them. And that um, Global Blockchain Business Council, you obviously are at the center of a lot of this. You're doing so much work in these areas. Well, get, got it. Thank you. That's great background. And I think Dale and I will um, jump right in and be able to um, engage the team on the call. I do want to step back and give a little background about why we're doing supply chain, why we're even thinking about it, because it is a strategic move we made uh, based on several um, reasons. Uh, again, my name is Paul Rapino, and I've been in blockchain, crypto, fintech for many years at Microsoft, and then the last several at um, at uh, startups, and uh, the last three at um, GBBC. Um, we are a combination of several organizations. We are one of the largest, the largest rather, um, association for blockchain technology. But the three components that, uh, that drive GBBC uh, are the Digital Finance Group, the Interwork Alliance, which is technology standards, and then the newest initiative is, is Bit Bitta. And I'll explain why we did that. These, as you mentioned, Alicia, these all have a symbiotic relationship. However, you need to break it down into the smallest increments to actually um, drive a use case. And then they start coming together and making sense. And that's what we've seen happen as we've extended our um, different initiatives across um, different verticals. So today, uh, Dale and I will talk briefly about our charter and roadmap, and we'd love your questions, comments, feedback. We literally, um, Got our deal done in July and taken about two months to uh, to integrate. And uh, we have um, done that. And now we're going to go out public. This is our first kickoff. We'll be doing others, as Alicia mentioned. I'll, I'll give you more detail on that at the end of the conversation. Um, but real quick, our initiative, all our initiatives are, we have a goal of doing three things. One, either helping members or the, uh, the industry drive partnership. Uh, we to develop education tools, uh, best practices, standards, and then advocacy. And more and more, that's becoming really valuable from a public policy side, where we have a footprint across uh, Asia, U US, and here, I mean, in uh, UK. And what's really great is when these use cases work and they're grassroots and they make sense and people are engaging and using them and seeing you know, real production or implementation, is it adds you know a whole different level of um, engagement at the policy side because then you're talking about specific issues and topics that need to be addressed based on reality and not assumption. So that's how that all comes together. We're 500 organizations made up of corporate, you know, the Microsoft, Accentures, Hyperledger, to other uh, non to nonprofits and um, uh, NGOs and government agencies. So. Um, about a year ago, Dale and I met and we said, you know, we've got a lot of demand for uh, what blockchain can do in the supply chain space. A lot of touch points across the globe are very inefficient. And so um, we spent uh, some time getting to know each other and it made sense that uh, we should merge organizations. Dale can tell you a little bit more about Bitta when, when I hand it over to him, but um, our strategic and plan was let's integrate Bitta. Let's take the assets, the resources, the minds, the the, the thought leadership that Dale and, and the leadership team that I have listed here have been driving, and let's one let's get it aligned, and then two let's use the GBB scale to get the message out and and get feedback so that we could start driving real world solutions at a global level. Um, there's a lot of solutions at the regional level or in, in test cases. So we're stepping up above that to both combine the best practices, but also to dig into how do we scale globally on an open source uh, platform or open source model that can be used with consistent standards. So with that, we um, brought Greg and Dale and Venetia from Delta and Bob from Salesforce into GBBC. 
And I joined the leadership team and we've been working. Uh, Dale and I have been together way too much, but it's been a great relationship. And we kind of speak together, uh, finish each other's sentences. Um, but it's really been cool to see how two worlds can combine and move into some um, some work that actually drives uh, some value. So I'm going to turn it over to Dale and um, I'll let Dale introduce himself. He's been a great asset in many ways and a good friend. So Dale, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here today. Happy to uh, participate in this. Um, I'm business fellow and blockchain strategist for FedEx. Uh, I've spent my entire career in the transportation industry. Um, I was in a, a strategy role as an officer at one of the operating companies uh, and led the first blockchain use case at FedEx in 2017. Uh, later that year, we, along with UPS and others, uh, became founding members of the Blockchain and Transport Alliance uh, and the Standards Council in particular. Um, and uh, I am the chairman of that uh, uh, coming into this. And now I lead the leadership team within the BIDA GBBC piece of this. And so um, I, I have to start very briefly by painting a picture, if I could, which is we you know, going back to 2017 and beyond, we really kind of, um, you know, we're trying to figure this whole thing out, right? You know, let's 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 figure this out. Let's build something. Let's do whatever the case may be, which most people in this space are trying to do. Um, and you guys are actually doing it, right? You're actually building things from that point of view. So I applaud that. Um, but we also came to a conclusion at that point that for this to scale, Again, my if I were doing a conference presentation right now, my very first slide literally is from the International Space Station. It's a, it's a picture of Earth. So imagine basically a 180 degree view of, a, of the globe looking at all the twinkling lights and all the you know, geography and everything else from that point of view. And as I would say, um, you know, FedEx, UPS, um, DHL, we, we go to 220 countries and territories. We go everywhere you can go in the world. And so for that discussion in 2017, 2018 and beyond, it's not about, oh, well, let's figure out a use case. Let's figure out this or let's figure out that. Um, I quickly, when I started leading the efforts in 2018, I, it, I quickly started to kind of pull back from what was typically a more North American or, or US domestic kind of view from most of my career into this true international space station level view. And at that level, there is no end, there is no company, right? None of these companies I've just mentioned. There is no company, there is no industry, there are no borders. Data knows no geographic borders. And so if I can pull you up a little bit for a few minutes on that before we even get into our mission statement, that's what's driving the mission statement. At that, at that level, it has to work for UPS, it has to work for FedEx or DHL or other examples or Delta or Salesforce or others. But it also has to work all the way to a bicycle delivery company who does not have an IT group, right? We have to think in, in these really large terms from that point of view. And um, so that's really where we felt the alignment was best with GBBC, which is at that true International Space Station level. Um, at that level, we have so so under what set of circumstances would things scale? Um, you know, you could get to a private or permission scenario in a specific industry. Um, uh, lots of examples of that from that point of view and, and actually some private examples of that. Walmart's got that in their leafy green area, various things like that. Metal Ledger is a, a fantastic example in the pharma space uh, with, the, with that U.S. kind of mo mostly U.S. industry. But at the true global commerce level, um, it has to work for everybody. It has to it has to be interoperable. Uh, our sense is that identity will play a key role in this whole thing, but there's almost nothing in our world that exists right now without standards, whether that is a traffic light or a four-way stop sign or uh, the electrical grid or interstate highways or the alphabet. I mean, almost everything in our world is standardized. And, you know, this whole uh, notion of a global supply chain I've spent my career in it. So to me, it's second nature. It's like breathing. But for most people in the world, many of them really didn't think of the global supply chain until the pandemic when they couldn't get a, you know, they couldn't get paper towels uh, and many other examples from that point of view. And, and so in the last few years, a couple of years, many, many people are now starting to look at that. Well, one of the things I would say is most people in the global supply chain don't realize they're in the global supply chain. 
right? It's just Paul, Paul Inc. or Dale Inc. And I've got a few customers and I've got to get my orders out and I've got to do this and this and this. But when you pull back and really look at that at that International Space Station level, it's millions of entities and it all starts connecting. It looks like a big you know, kind of a spaghetti bowl or something, but um, it, there's a lot to it. Foundationally, we came to that conclusion early on that standards were going to be critical. That's why we were one of the founding members of BIDA in 2017. So how do we do that? There's lots of standards entities. I, I could put you to sleep. If you have any problems sleeping, I could literally put you to sleep by walking through all the standards entities and what they're doing you know, in Europe and in US and all, you know, China and everything else from that point of view. Um, but from our point of view, where we see the play for BIDA is that, that the world needs an har a harmonizer, a, an effort to harmonize these things. We are technology agnostic. Uh, we are focused on open source and royalty-free data standards. Um, and we are happy to work with other like-minded entities um, a really good example is World Customs. Um, I had the opportunity in 2019 to, to speak on a panel, be participate in a panel there. And at the time, uh, we're discussing the fact that World Customs has standards, but they were proprietary. And the response was simply, why? Why should that be a money-making thing? We need standards that everybody can use, that are inter they're truly interoperable, that are truly open, and we can connect all those dots from that point of view. And so, uh, as it turns out, we were successful in getting them to open up their standards. So we certainly hope there's other examples of that moving forward. But right now, we're focused on the open piece of that. That's where we think this ultimately scales uh, and to uh, uh, to align with and work with other entities. So I'm not going to get stuck on any of the other individual slides. I just needed to kind of set that up so that hopefully by the time you read the mission statement, um, which is we're working with others, we're focused on open, and then we're going to drive the effort, uh, you know, uh, we aren't the only ones. Certainly lots of great, lots of standards exist. Lots of things happen, whether that's ISO or World Customs or UN or lots of other things. And, we're, and the early initiative with GBBC and the GSMI, Global Standards Mapping Initiative 4.0, we are the supply chain piece of that. So we're doing the deep dive right now in the early use of the first version of GSMI that will be out this fall. Uh, and then we will use that as research information moving forward for BIDA. So anyway, again, um, I, I won't, I'm not going to read all this to you. What do we think? We think the future is paperless. Um, what do we do? What do we need to do to get to that? Um, certainly a lot. It's years on the horizon, but there's a lot of movements toward that direction. Uh, we certainly think identity is going to be key to that. That'll be kind of the holy grail from that point of view. Um, we think that open is inevitable in this space. We think that's where, that's how it will scale. And that's one of the reasons why I spend as much time talking about more global thought leadership kinds of things. And I'm not up here selling a FedEx product or any other product, whatever the case may be from that point of view. We think we think it's gonna take a pro-competitive, what I refer to as coopetition, a global village working together to do this, just like you're doing with Hyperledger, just like many others are doing. We're simply trying to bring all those together into uh, uh, fewer and fewer and hopefully ultimately one conversation. Paul, thank you. Um, I think we went too far. Back one, there we go. So again, I, I've used the word harmonizer. Uh, the keywords there, harmonizer, open. Um, we are starting to work on the backbone of that. So there's lots of places to start. You could literally start by just identifying all the standards entities and pulling everything you can pull and push them together in like essentially a big spreadsheet. Um, that would be one way of accomplishing it, but it doesn't really give you your, tr your true north. Uh, we think our true north is actually in the movement space. So point A to point B, likely across a border. So the data elements, you know, you could easily get literally into hundreds, maybe almost a thousand data elements. If you literally identified all the movement pieces, all the business pieces, all the customs and clearance pieces, import, export, everything else from that point of view. Uh, we're going to start with, we think, maybe around 50 or so that are kind of the key points here, buyer, seller, country of origin. Those are the kind of basics. And we're going to start from there with this first effort. Uh, and then we're going to expand it out. So for example, um, country of origin, country code, for example, uh, is one of the least controversial ones. Pretty much everybody uses the same one. But if you go out and look at World Customs, if you go out and look at BIDA, if you go out and look at others from that point of view, 
most of them point to the ISO standard on that. And so there is no controversy on that one. We, pretty much everybody says, yep, that's the list. It's the same. I don't know what the number is, 240 or 60 or whatever the number of countries. I don't remember what that is. We go to 220. Um, some we can't go to, but it's not controversial. That's a good example of, okay, can we all agree? Yes, we can agree. But it's not that clear once we start broadening this thing, when we start getting out into, uh, well, what about, you know, um, invoice information or what about uh, weight or description or commodity, or there's lots of kind of synonyms, if you will, in this thing that we know of as global commerce that has been um, evolving literally since the Romans and the Phoenicians. I mean, the bill of lading it has existed for literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of years. It goes back that far. And yet the, the next step, if we can envision it, the next step is to digitize that, which then gets you, so digitization uh, could be a uh, an item going over to a PDF or could be a, a, another digitized type item. Digital, digitalization, digitalization allows you to now say, well, let me look at the processes within that. Let me redesign some of those processes. And all of that's going to lead you to digital value. And we think foundationally, these open standards are going to be at the base of all of that. Once we can build this, it literally takes the globe, not just FedEx, not just UPS, not just any example that you want. It takes all of us to an entirely new level that we, we can really then start envisioning how we can truly streamline these global processes. And where I get to coopetition is we sat down, uh, we were on stage. Um, I represented FedEx, UPS and DHL were both there as well uh, on stage in 2019 in Toronto, where we talked, just calmly talked about, you know, where can we agree? That's my definition of coopetition. It's not about where we compete. It's about where we can agree, pro-competitive. And we're, one of the places we can agree is where we can reduce friction across borders. That's paper, that's delays, that's resources, that's all the things that we all experienced personally as consumers during the pandemic, uh, pain points that we experienced, where we can reduce friction across borders, we all win. And so the broader view of that is we believe that these bit of efforts are foundational. Once, they, once we can get it to a common language, a, a, a common data language, open data language, now we can build emerging technologies and emerging systems off of that. And that literally takes the world to an entirely different place. So Paul, so uh, again, we, we've started since July, we've been very busy. Uh, Paul and I are on the phone a lot with each other and we have uh, uh, the other beta members and we've also got the GSMI, Global Standards Mapping Initiative 4.0, uh, effort going on. Uh, Greg Brown from UPS and I are the co-chair of that. And we're working on the 4.0 supply chain piece of that. So there's a lot, a lot of movement, a lot of editing, a lot of researching, a lot of stuff going on from that point of view. Um, but basically, you know, we, we've established some of these pieces. Uh, and by the way, um, one of the early questions that Paul and I had to work through is what's, what's BIDA versus what's GSMI? Where does, where, where does one, you know, go and the other stop or whatever? I think of them as a Venn diagram, so two two overlapping you know circles, if you will, uh, or, or graphics. Um, and uh, the research arm of BIDA is essentially the GSMI 4.0 supply chain piece. And so uh, we are working on the GSMI piece right now. Uh, we hope to have that. That'll be done yet this fall. Uh, and that will be the jumpstart to the bit of work where we will continue to go deeper and deeper and broader and broader. So working with other entities and all the rest of those kinds of things. Um, and uh, but this actually accelerates the start of BIDA and the timing worked out for us to do that. And we are thrilled to be involved with the GSMI 4.0 effort. Yeah. And Dale, um, I will I'm going to put in the uh, text box GSMI. It's the Global Standards Mapping Initiative. GBBC started it with um, with uh, the World Economic Forum uh, about um, what four years ago, three years ago, and now this is our fourth iteration. Each year, we review standards across different initiatives, different best practices, and do exactly what um, what Dale just mentioned. Uh, and I'll send the link so you can get a look at it and and um, look at ways to participate. But we added supply chain this year, and that's what Dale's referencing because we thought it was a really good fit 
for us to use the group to drive some of the early research. And then we'll take those findings as well as some of the other assumptions we have and move the business forward. So here's so here's a slighter, a slightly more detailed version of that, which is ultimately this has to be end to end, right? It has to be cradle to grave, basically, but end to end on any movement. Um, we're starting with where we think is the, the 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 foundational piece, kind of the backbone of movement is basically I bought something from you, uh, and it needs to move from point A to point B. And what are the key elements there? And certainly, just like what you've been working on, you start somewhere and you're going to iterate, you're going to add likely upstream and downstream from that, and we, we will build from there uh, and broaden it out. Um, we then are identifying, we're narrowing down on key movement data elements. Those are kind of maybe the first 50 or so that we think will will cover the basics to start with. Um, we are working on uh, mapping the existing standards. Uh, that's giving us a really good opportunity to determine what standards are out there. A, B, which are open, very, very important. Um, it, we don't really believe that um, somebody's business layer, supporting somebody's business layer to prep, to pay for standards is how this will scale ultimately. Um, and um, then ultimately we're working on uh, where we think this whole paperless supply chain thing will go, what that, what that might look like. Um, I will also tell you this in full transparency, um, we are, we are a member of, there are three entities that are a member of the Global Express Association, FedEx, UPS, and DHL. Most people don't know that that exists, but GEA is a fantastic resource. They are very connected to World Customs, World Trade, and others. And uh, in 2019, the three uh, member companies, UPS, DHL, FedEx, worked together on a position paper on a uh, position paper and a call to action to world customs and world trade on open standards and interoperable standards within this technology. Um, and uh, earlier this year, the Global Express Association, again, representing those three members, came out with a paperless trade document that really envisions where that whole thing goes. So that is not technically part of BIDA, but two of the three members are leadership team members of BIDA. And so we are really starting to align pretty closely uh, on some of these key things as we move forward. Um, certainly all this will have to involve regulatory agencies. So people like U.S. Customs, Department of Homeland Security, others as well, certainly around the globe from that point of view. But it's a big, it's a big discussion and we are proud to be involved with kind of helping to harmonize that um, uh, as we move this thing forward. Um, one, one final comment on that one, uh, which is that the standards is the starting point, but certainly we also believe that reference architecture, reference implementation is key to this. Um, and um, that certainly is going to be something that's going to need to scale as well. So whatever the early use cases there will be very foundational, uh, as I would say, you know, probably too generically, but not too far from this point A to point B, maybe comma across a border, maybe comma with a sensor. Um, but it's going to start basic from that point of view. And then little by little, we can expand out from there. Yeah. And I'll Paul? just, uh, yeah, I just want to interject, um, uh, recognize uh, Alan Stoll from UPS is here. And then Greg Bourne from GBBC, he just posted um, the link for GSMI. So you can take a look at that uh, after we're completed, but I just wanted to call that out. Yeah, and I think we're down to just this slide. Um, again, it's not a it's it's hard to describe this, but it's not at this moment the the view the strategy is not a process improvement initiative. We can get to process improvement by saying, well, here's what they did in the maritime ships in the 1600s, and now we can do something slightly different, whatever the case may be. Part of this is really going up into that international space station view and saying, look not if, but when these items are digitized, when we have a common data language, an open source data language, then the then blockchain and these emerging technologies can then come in over the top of that and move forward for, for the benefit of all, for the commons, right? And so what you are working on in your groups, um, uh, we are trying to focus on that as well, literally at the, the global level in terms of that. And it's going to take a lot of people. It's going to take a pro-competitive, as I would say, co to do it. 
It's going to take adults at the table to simply say, look, this, this is going to have to work for everyone. If I, if I have to provide my private information, I won't do it. If I have to have an ID department and I don't right now, I'm not going to do it. We have to solve for all those things. And I know we've got bright, capable people on this call that are working through your own versions of that. So with that, uh, Paul, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Dale. I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to uh, ask the first one, though. Two two ahas that I learned in jumping into this project. And my background is technology and, and business development. So have really enjoyed learning kind of what's broken and what we can fix. Um, one of the comments Dale made earlier uh, caught me. It's most people that are in the supply chain don't even realize it. So that was a, wow, there's a, that's, it's a big problem if you don't know you're part of the problem uh, to fix it. Um, but the other one was that the company, the, the reason this hasn't been done earlier, there's many reasons it hasn't been done earlier, but I thought one of the calls we had a couple months ago, um, and I think it was uh, Venetia from Delta or somebody said, look, we could, you know, we've all done workarounds, one-offs to fix what's broken. And we realize that that helps our company or their company, but it doesn't solve the overall solution. So Dale, I don't know if you could talk about that, but the idea of, um, you know, you guys are big enough to, to to do it yourself versus, you know, why do we have to go scale across several different companies? You mentioned a little bit, but can you give maybe an example of what that what that looked like and how you're trying to solve that? Yeah, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the very first use case we did in 2017 was a Hyperledger use case. Uh, we are from a FedEx point of view, I'm speaking now from a FedEx point of view, we are technology agnostic. We think there's going to be a you know dominant design. We think a number of things are going to have to happen for that to happen. But one of the first things we did was we think it's going to take a global supply chain blockchain and we built one and it worked. And only then did we realize it, it won't work because it can't scale. And that's why that's why little by little, my perspective has changed literally to this international space station level. And it's not just about FedEx. Certainly we're in business to be in business and everybody else is as well. But, um, you know, if I think of an Android phone, which I have, uh, you know, it takes an open foundation and then any one of us could build a proprietary app that sits on top of that. So certainly we all want to take advantage of that, but we can't skip that step. And I think that's part of what Venetia or whomever it was that was saying that was referring to that. Uh, it really does take this big, broad, global view to say, wait a second, we are, if I'm saying that most people don't know they're in the global supply chain, I would also add that to anybody on any call, which is most of us don't think of ourselves as part of the global supply chain, and yet you are. You buy things online and you do these things, and there's value not only personally, but in my case, professionally, uh, and for many of us in the supply chain space to really envision something that is completely different. These technologies, blockchain and emerging technologies, you know, uh, verifiable credentials, zero knowledge proofs, these kinds of things are going to fundamentally change what hasn't been changed in thousands of years. And um, that's, that's what makes this so exciting. Is it a slow burn? Yes. Is it going to take a lot of effort and a lot of discussions like this? Absolutely. But there's a lot of fantastic work already in play moving forward in some of these spaces. And we're very happy to connect with GBBC and the GSMI effort and where we think we can take this moving forward. Thanks, Dale. So um, I will um, re uh, reiterate what um, Alicia said at the beginning. So this is our first meeting. So I would love to get some feedback. I'm going to give you a little um, preview of what we're planning on the working group. And I'd, I'd love to get feedback from the group here, kind of what we need to add, what we can go deeper on, um, maybe what we've missed um, or what you agree with. And um, uh, so let's see, on Thursday, the 26th, we'll be rolling out our work group plan and our, our ability, our uh, plan to scale the group. And the projects we're going to work on we have to work get down to this, but we're going to break it down into two pieces: a business side and a, and a kind of a technical tech uh, taxonomy side. And we really feel that breaking it down into small groups to ad address a business use case is the key thing that needs to be done correctly. So we'll be talking more about this and how you can get involved either as a member or non-member um, down the line. But I wanted to know if there are any questions from the group. I had a question. Yes, uh, Ned here. So, uh, um, my question was: Are is Bitta working with? Um, I see like Waves BL, Trade Trust, Trade Waltz. Read about them all the time on LinkedIn, and I think uh, Trade Trust did a 
a trade using blockchain, uh, blockchain from Miami to India. So I'm curious if you guys are working with those entities, those companies that seem to be uh, bringing blockchain to try to, you know, get people to the EBL initiative of 2030. Yeah, I would say not yet. Um, again, we're starting on the on the standard side of things, standards entities. So that gets you to the DCSA piece that I think you just referred to, the EBL piece. Uh, there are some great efforts. Um, there's an effort uh, in Europe, DSI, through the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're just starting in those spaces right now. So that's that's where we're starting. And certainly the dots start connecting pretty quickly. I mean, there's existing things out there like ISO, UNC fact and Edifact and things like that. Early on, we're simply trying to figure out what's out there, right? In in the open space, uh, but certainly a, an EBL initiative is massive, massive, um, and is an example of what we're trying to talk about here. And yet, even with that, even with a, well, of course, we're going to jump into that space. We also still have to make sure that it will work for everybody, that it's common, that it's open and those kinds of things. So we're just early, really early in that process at this truly global level. But certainly I've, I'm following the EBL initiatives and, and who's part of that and what that looks like and who's signed on to it and what their commitments are and, and, and some other examples like that. Are those companies that you'd want to join and be part of some upcoming events, putting their um, feedback, or is that something down, further down the road? Where you'd let, get, let you know, I'd be interested if you've got uh, access either to Alicia or some way to get that to me, that's fine. Okay. I'd love to learn more about any of the ones that you're bringing up. I'm not that familiar. I've heard, heard of a couple of them, certainly the EBL initiative, but the specifics of that, I'd like to learn that. Um, and so if you can get that to me somehow, that would be excellent. Yeah. I think we're just early. I think we're just a little early to really start uh, aligning with them or, or or going specifically down there. We're just kind of in a fact-finding mode at the at this point. And I think that will help us uh, establish our kind of our baseline information. Okay, I get that. Then if you, you want to forward it to me, I'm happy to, to share that with Dale and, okay. and share contact information. And then to build Thank on you, your good information. About what our proactive plan is to engage. So- there's a couple of ways. Did you want, did you have something else, no, Alicia? Go ahead, go ahead. There's a couple of ways. Uh, one will be, the first one will be with GSMI. We're going to publish our, our our point of view, our feedback on where we think the market is today. That will go out to public review in um, November. Um, we are opening that up to non-members for review. You can go on to GBBC. I think we did a call out yesterday. Maybe Greg, if you could find that or send it out to Alicia later uh, to get reviewers or or um, to raise your hand and say you're interested. That would be the first one publicly. Mm -hmm. Separately, we've got, um, I don't know, some 30 companies within GBBC, both um, private and public companies that have a significant interest in um, engaging on this with us. And that will scale this even further. We've got a lot of experience doing this with the sustainability side. Many, Some of you may have worked on our IWA project around uh, voluntary carbon markets. We're following a similar blueprint. And then the end game would be to um, get that collaboration where we can, but also to know where we disagree or we're just not going, we're gonna put it in a parking lot. Cause some of the side bars we've had over the last couple of years are things that we can't necessarily solve. They're maybe regulatory driven or they're specific to a country. We're looking for the common language that is going to be consistent across a global scope and and and, and then prioritize that. Like Dale said, there we looked a couple of weeks ago, there were potentially 900 different touch points. We're still quantifying that, but um, getting feedback on who's out there, what they're doing. Um, yes, please send that in and we'll continue to collect that um, as well. Other questions? Edwin. Yeah, so uh, hi, I'm Edwin. Um, I know you guys mentioned talking about developing an Android-like standard. Um, my question is, is there a vision for what blockchains the standard will be built on, such as like Hyperledger Fabric or Quorum, uh, or is it still too early to tell? You're on mute, Dale.
Sorry, I was trying to be polite and I was just rude. Um, um, I would tell you that from the early days, from a FedEx point of view, we have been technology agnostic. As I said, we've used Hyperledger, we've used Ethereum. Uh, ultimately, if you flip it around and you look at it from, for example, US Customs or Department of Homeland Security, um, I, I think they are thinking of this, they're actually kind of blockchain agnostic whether you use blockchain or not, either way, from their point of view, they're thinking of it, A, it has to be interoperable, uh, B, uh, they're going down, uh, pretty quickly going down the identity path. So I am who I say I am, and I can prove that, whether that's verifiable credentials or whatever the case may be. So um, our sense, uh, and therefore my sense from a bit of point of view is agnostic. Uh, we think a number of things are going to happen. The broader things would be interoperable. The broader things would be open. We've said open since 2019. We think that's where that's going. Um, uh, and it has to scale for everyone. It, ha it has to work for everyone. So however that goes, again, I am on the business and strategy side, not on the technical side. Um, so many here on this call uh, may have broader perspectives from, from that point of view or ideas on how they think that's actually going to happen. But that's what we've been saying for several years. So I'll stick with that. Yeah, and I'll build on that, Dale. That Thank you. Um, the On the technical side or the, the platform side, um, we need a foundational layer of what the data is that would 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 go across different platforms. So we want to stay on the open source, you know, platform agnostic side. And again, the examples of of things that do work toward implementation are is if you can get a baseline of data, a taxonomy of what things are called, so there's consistency and there's a standard published or at least a taxonomy published. Um, that moves you from when on the private or the proprietary implementation side for whatever the 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 um, technology is, um, you instead of starting at, at point A and going to your market or to your customer or to your partner base and saying, you know, A is this, B, C, D, all the different things that have to happen for you to plug into our platform. Here's the bit of standard or here's the IWA, whatever it, like we agree on the first 20, 20 items you've already scaled significantly. And we've seen that on the IWA projects where they've gone from zero to 50, so to speak, uh, miles an hour, zero to 60, uh, you know, and then cut that half, cut that in half, uh, you know, the next time on version two. So we envision version one is just a taxonomy, open source baseline, what things are called, how they work, what the standards are that are in place, what's not in place, and then publish what those standards are. And then the groups can take them and move into, um, move into any kind of implementation proprietary or not. Yeah, I would I would follow up with one final comment, which is this is a group of experts on this call. You may have knowledge that would be helpful to us. If you're aware of those things that already exist in the open space, again, please get those to Alicia and get them to us. We're still gathering some of these things. Um, and uh, anything and everything would be helpful. I think we're all envisioning a similar future here, but uh, we would love to uh, learn from you as well. We have a oh, Thank you. Does somebody thank else you. want to go? Or I had a quick question as well. So I spent about eight years living and working in China, and one of the challenges I saw there, both when I was working with UNIDO on industrial development, and also teaching international business undergrads, MBAs, working with other companies on global trade um, was often a lack of inclusion uh, on global conversations in the Chinese with Chinese companies. You mentioned before that GBBC does have a uh, a group of a group working in Asia. I'm wondering, are you speaking with Alibaba? Are you working with JD.com, these giants of trade that do so much on infrastructure and logistics? And I know they're doing more around the region as well, Southeast Asia, East Asia. And I one of my concerns back in the US is I'm still not always seeing the conversation being inclusive of companies that are leading the way in other parts of the world. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, take that. So yes, we do as GBBC, we have a global footprint, but until we have a specific use case, it's hard to know where to go after. So, but I will give you an example in digital finance, 
we have a significant relationship across the globe, all the way from technical standards to um, policy uh, standards or regulatory standards. Um, and you can go to the GBC, GBBC website, GDF uh, area or GDF.org. Um, and you can get an idea of, of the big picture of how we do that globally. Uh, then if you move it into to our standards on um, sustainability, once we have a point of view and feedback globally from our core group of, of uh, worker of um, work groups, uh, then we have something meaningful to go out to the marketplace with and we have those relationships. And like Dale said, we'll collect those and do the same. We'll follow the same model on, on this as well. Um, perfect example is a significant opportunity is in place right now um, in the UK, which um, we won't get into the specific details, but we re they reached out to us yesterday. Dale put a point of view together. We see ways we can actually plug and play. So once you start announcing to the marketplace, as you know what you do, people can either agree or disagree, but at least you have a point of conversation to start on. So totally agree. And that was Dale's point from the beginning that International Space Station only happens when you have an international engagement. Great, thank you. But we might look to you for more background on China and Asia. Glad to have happy to have that discussion. We have a few minutes left. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if you do think of any or think of us when you come up with the standards or uh, you know something related that you thought we'd be interested in, um, please send it out to us. Uh, Alicia, you could send the presentation out. Uh, let me send you the the. Um, PDF version will be easier for you to send out. Okay. I sent you the 21 meg, meg um, right. file. Thank I you. Made... Are you. Are you comfortable with me also posting that to the agenda page, to the notes page for the meeting? Yeah, yeah. I'll just send you the PowerPoint or the PDF version after this call. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Dale, Paul, this has been very informative. I want to thank both of you for coming on, also for having Alan and Greg here. Um, you shared a lot. I know I'm going to be thinking over this for a while and I will probably have follow-up questions. I imagine some of our members might as well. I see David raising his hand. David he's Odie. Clapping. No, he's, I think he's applauding. He, yeah, thank okay. you, David. <laughs> I didn't even know there okay. was an applaud thing on here. I have to look yeah. the reactions thing to see that, but thank you. <laughs> so you. Please reach out if you need to or want to, and we appreciate the time. Great. Again, thank you so much. This has been, this has been very educational. We appreciate it. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye -bye. Keep up the good work. Thank you. You too.